the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Alice Bryant, Anna Mateo, and Brian Lynn. We close the show with the next episode of our American History series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Brian Lynn presents this week's Science and Technology Report. The American Space Agency, NASA, says its Mars Explorer, or rover, has successfully collected its first Martian rock sample. The rover, called Perseverance, used a drill attached to its robotic arm to remove a small circular sample, also called a core, from a larger rock on the surface of Mars. NASA confirmed the successful collection in a statement on Monday. The agency also released pictures of the sample, which it said appears to be about as thick as a writing instrument. After the drilling was completed, Perseverance took additional pictures of the sample as well as the tube it was kept in. The images are useful to scientists back on Earth who study the sample. In the final step, Perseverance moved the tube to a storage area inside the rover and hermetically sealed the container. Hermetic sealing is a process that completely closes off the container so that no air can flow in or out. The Perseverance team shared the news on Twitter. It's official. I've now captured, sealed, and stored the first core sample ever drilled on another planet in a quest to return samples to Earth. The tweet added that the sample was the first in a one-of-a-kind Martian rock collection. It was the second collection attempt for Perseverance. The first one happened about a month ago. In that try, NASA confirmed that the rover had successfully drilled into another rock at a different site on the Mars surface. But during the collection attempt, images showed that the sample tube was empty. NASA engineers later reported that the rock the rover drilled into must not have been strong enough to produce a core sample. So the drilling operation only produced dust that could not be collected. The latest core sample and all others collected from now on will be stored on Mars until they can be picked up during future missions to the Red Planet and brought to Earth. NASA says its Mars sample return mission to be carried out jointly with the European Space Agency could have the rock samples back to Earth sometime in the 2030s. NASA science officer Thomas Surbuchen called the successful collection a truly historic moment. The agency's leader Bill Nelson also praised the effort and said, I can't wait to see the incredible discoveries produced by Perseverance and our team. 
Perseverance landed in February at Jezero Crater, an area scientists believe to be the remains of an ancient river system. The high-tech rover is on a mission to search for signs of ancient microbial life on Mars. Perseverance has been assisted in some efforts by a small experimental helicopter called Ingenuity. The helicopter made history in April by becoming the first aircraft to perform a powered, controlled flight on another planet. So far, Ingenuity has performed above expectations, completing 11 flight tests and helping to identify areas for Perseverance to explore. Ken Farley is a project scientist on the Perseverance team. He said the latest collection effort marks the beginning of many more to come for the rover, which has 43 sample tubes to fill. There is a lot of Jezero Crater left to explore, and we will continue our journey in the months and years ahead, Farley said in a statement. When we get these samples back to Earth, they are going to tell us a great deal about some of the earliest chapters in the evolution of Mars, he added. I'm Brian Lynn. Joan MacDonald's health was suffering. At age 71, she was overweight and on several medications. She had high cholesterol, rising blood pressure, and kidney trouble. Her daughter is a fitness trainer. She warned that MacDonald would become severely unwell if she did not make big changes. So she did. She went to the fitness center for the first time and learned to eat healthy with the help of a new tool, an iPhone. Now, age 75, McDonald promotes fitness on social media. She has 1.4 million followers on Instagram. She is part of a growing number of grandfluencers, people over the age of 70, who have huge numbers of social media followers. Many of their fans are several years younger. It's so rare to find someone her age being able to do all these things, said 18-year-old follower Marianne Zapata. McDonald and other older social media influencers are turning their popularity into a profit. McDonald has paid partnerships, including with the sportswear and nutrition company Women's Best. She also just launched her own health and fitness app. On TikTok, four friends who go by the handle Old Gaze have 2.2 million followers. The four men who are gay are all age 65 or older. They use TikTok to humor fans with their incorrect answers to popular culture questions. They have a paid promoting deal with Grindr, a gay dating app. Legetta Wayne, who is 78, is another grandfluencer. She has young people asking her to be their grandmother. 
Online, she attends to and cooks vegetables from her garden. She goes by Miss Grandma's Garden on TikTok. Wayne, who is based in Susun, California, has gained nearly 131,000 followers since June 2020. She owes her social media success to her young granddaughter. Her very first video, a garden walkthrough, got 37,600 likes. One day, my garden was very pretty, and I got all excited about that. And I asked her if she would take some pictures of me, Wayne recalled. She said she was going to put me on TikTok, and I said, well, what is TikTok? I had never heard of it. Since the pandemic, Grandfluencers have expanded their social media use beyond Facebook. Jesse Martin is the second youngest of the old gays. He is 68 years old and lives in the California desert town of Cathedral City. Like McDonald, the men who are part of the old gays fight against mistruths about what is possible in older age. They're showing that you don't have to be afraid of aging. The 20 and 30-somethings don't often think about that, Allison Bryant said. She is an executive with AARP, an interest group for older Americans. Sandra Salen a writer and artist, has slowly built her following to 25,300 on Instagram. Her reach recently grew to include the British Olympic gold-winning swimmer Tom Daly after he tried one of her family recipes. Salon's social media centers around cooking and beauty. She also shares pictures from her past and travels. I wanted to expand my world. I felt that I was older, that my world was shrinking. People were moving and people were sick, Salen said. She started her blog because she wanted to reach people. Salen said it was hard to learn how to use Instagram. She said she is surprised that many of her followers are 30 to 40 years younger than she is. Toby Bloomberg, who is 69, is a Salon supporter. She found Salon after Salon competed on the Food Network television show Clash of the Grandmas. She talks a lot about aging, Bloomberg said. That is unusual on social media. Since it is controlled by young people, Bloomberg added. Grace Mayer, who is 32, stays home full time with her two young children. She follows Barbara Costello, a 72 year old Connecticut grandmother who uses the handle Brunch with Babs. She does these posts Did your mom ever tell you? And I followed her immediately on Instagram, Mayer said. Costello has many suggestions for living life that remind Mayer of her own grandmother. And Costello seems like the kind of person who would welcome you into her home, she said. May Karwowski is founder and chief executive of the influencer marketing agency Obviously, she has more than 100 influencers in her network between the ages of 60 and 80. Karwalski said people like young fashion influencers often have whole teams of people helping to run their social media accounts. But a lot of 70-plus aged influencers are doing everything themselves. 
Karwalski said, Most media news presents a really narrow viewpoint on this age group. What's great about social media is you can follow a really cool 75 year old woman who is just doing her thing in Florida. And that's fun, she said. That's different. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Alice Bryant. VOA Learning English. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In 1823, President James Monroe introduced one of the most important foreign policy decisions in American history. It became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The doctrine said the United States never had and never would take part in any war between the European powers. At the same time, it warned the Europeans against interfering in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe declared that the Americas are not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Historian Harlow Giles Unger says the Monroe Doctrine marked the end of the colonial era. The United States now considered the entire Western Hemisphere our sphere of influence, that we would keep out of their affairs, but they must keep out of our affairs. The United States continued to grow. New states joined the Union. Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama all became states before 1820. Louisiana had earlier become the first state to be formed from part of the Louisiana Territory that the United States bought from France. The rest of this huge area was called the Missouri Territory. By 1819, there were enough people in part of the Missouri Territory for that part to become the state of Missouri. But becoming a state required the approval of Congress. And historian Harlow Giles Unger says admitting Missouri would have changed the balance of power in the Senate. The Senate gave each state two votes. And... By convention, since the signing of the Constitution, the Senate was evenly divided between slave states and non-slave states. So the admission of Missouri would have added a slave state to the, uh, the Senate and left the northern non-slave states as a minority, and they were not going to accept this. Slaves were not new in America. Spain had brought them to the West Indies hundreds of years before. In 1619, a ship brought 20 African slaves to Jamestown, Virginia. These black men were sold to farmers. Over the years, the use of slaves spread to all the American colonies. However, there were many more slaves in the agricultural South than in the North. The farms in the North were smaller and needed less labor. But in the South, farms were much larger. Slaves were the least expensive form of labor. Most of the Northern states had passed laws before 1800 freeing slaves. Even the southern states made it illegal to import more slaves from Africa. But those southerners who already owned slaves believed they were necessary, and they refused to free them. 
Slavery had been legal when France and Spain controlled the Louisiana Territory. The United States did nothing to change this when it purchased the territory. So slavery was permitted in the Missouri Territory at the time Missouri asked for statehood. A New York congressman, James Talmadge, offered an amendment to Missouri's request to become a state. Talmadge proposed that no more slaves be brought into Missouri and that the children of slaves already there be freed at the age of 25. His proposal started a debate that lasted a year. Supporters of Talmadge argued that his proposed amendment was constitutional. The Constitution, they said, gave Congress the right to admit new states into the Union. This also meant, they said, that Congress could refuse to admit new states unless these states met conditions demanded by Congress. Supporters of the amendment also said small farmers of the North and East could not compete with the Southern farmers and the free labor of slaves. They argued that these Northern and Eastern farmers had as much right to the land of Missouri as anyone else. The Louisiana Territory had been paid for by the taxes of all Americans. Those opposed to slavery also argued that slaveholding states would be given too great a voice in the government if Missouri joined them. Under the Constitution, only three out of every five slaves were counted in the national population. The census, taken every ten years, is used to set the number of members for each state in the House of Representatives. In the House, unlike the Senate, the number of votes that a state has is based on its population. In the past, each time a slave state was admitted to the Union, a free state had also been admitted. Harlow Giles Unger explains what the supporters of the amendment may have been thinking. Uh, the problem basically was not so much a moral problem from their point of view. It was much moral as it was economic because the uh, northern states could not compete uh, with southern states. Northern states paid their labor by the peace. In the South, slave labor was free of charge. So the South had a tremendous economic advantage. They could produce goods at much lower cost than the North. And the advent of a majority in the Senate would have tilted the balance of power. Southerners had an answer for each argument of those supporting the Talmadge Amendment. They agreed that Congress had the constitutional right to admit or reject a state. But they said Congress did not have the right to make conditions for a territory to become a state. William Pinckney of Maryland argued that states already in the Union had joined without any conditions. If Congress, he declared, had the right to set conditions for new states, then these new states would not be equal to the old ones. The United States would no longer be a union of equal states. The debate was intense on both sides. The House of Representatives passed the Missouri bill with the Talmadge Amendment, but the Senate rejected it. The people of Missouri would try again for statehood when the new Congress met in 1820. By this time, another free state was ready to enter the Union. Maine, with the permission of Massachusetts, asked to become a separate state. The Senate joined the Maine Bill with the one for unconditional statehood for Missouri. 
Senators refused to separate the two, and so they continued to debate about conditions for statehood and slavery. Finally, Senator Jesse Thomas of Illinois offered a compromise. He said Maine could be admitted as a free state and Missouri as a state permitting slavery. But he said that no other state allowing slavery could be formed from the northern part of the Louisiana Territory. Many Southerners were not satisfied. The compromise closed the door against slavery entering large new areas of land. Southerners, like any other Americans, had a right to settle in the new territory. The Senate accepted Thomas's compromise. Congress approved statehood for both Missouri and Maine. Now President Monroe just needed to sign the bills. It was the spring of 1820. James Monroe was coming to the end of his first four years as president. He wanted to be elected again, but he faced a difficult decision about whether to allow the Missouri Compromise. President Monroe owned slaves. He understood the feelings of the South. His friends urged him to veto the Compromise Bill because it limited slavery in the territory. He also understood the strong feelings of those who opposed slavery. Monroe believed the compromise was wrong, but not because it kept slaves out of the territory. The president did not believe the Constitution gave Congress the right to make such conditions. Monroe even wrote a veto message explaining why he could not approve the compromise, but in the end, he did not use his veto. He believed there might be civil war if he rejected the compromise. So Monroe signed the bill. Missouri had permission to enter the Union as a slave state. The crisis seemed to end, but a few months later, a new problem developed. Missouri wrote a state constitution that it sent to Congress for approval. One part of this constitution did not permit free black men to enter the state. A number of lawmakers in Congress immediately opposed the state constitution. They said it violated the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution said citizens of each state had the same rights as citizens of each of the other states. And since free black men were citizens of some states, they should have the right to be citizens of Missouri. The debate lasted several months. Former House Speaker Henry Clay finally proposed a compromise that both sides accepted. Missouri could become a state if its legislature would make this promise. It would never pass any law that would violate the rights of any citizen of another state. This second compromise ended the dispute over slavery in Missouri and the Louisiana Territory. The Compromise Actions of 1820 settled the crisis of slavery for more than 20 years. But everyone knew that the settlement was only temporary. Former President Thomas Jefferson expressed his feelings with these words. This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed, indeed, for the moment. But this is a reprieve only, he said, not a final sentence. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. 
and I'm Ashley Thompson.